Hello and welcome to the second in a series of training packages for our local officials. <clears throat> this package and this video will focus on representing members through the disciplinary process. Disciplinary representation is probably the most valued service that we provide our members on an individual basis. It can make the difference between somebody remaining in the job, um, remaining motivated in the job, seeing value uh, in, the, in the service, uh, feeling a valued employee by the service. On the flip side of that, it can destroy careers, it can destroy long-term working relationships, it can destroy personal relationships that are indirectly connected with the role and it can have a huge impact both positively and negatively uh, if it's not managed correctly by the service and one of our jobs as a representative body is to ensure that that process is fair fair to the individual fair to the service fair to other parties involved who may have made complaints etc to demonstrate just how important this service provision is, the majority of our local officials have become local officials because we have represented them through the disciplinary process and they have realised the value of being a member of the FRSA and also being able to call upon their support when they have been the subject of a complaint. Now, the individual that you're representing, you may have never met, you may have never spoken to, you may not even be aware of. So, um, right at the very outset, you need to have honest conversations with them. You need them to trust you implicitly. You need them to tell you all the gory details of exactly what has happened, all the background story, um, because if you if you are able to elicit all that information you will be prepared for the worst case scenario you will be prepared for every eventuality if that doesn't happen you can find yourself as i have done and other officials have done over the years um, sitting in a hearing thinking that you've got all the bases covered thinking that the hearing is going to go one particular way thinking that you've got all the correct information and then all of a sudden there will be a bombshell uh, a bombshell that the individual was aware of but that decided not to inform you about. So to try and ensure that that doesn't happen or happens as infrequently as possible you have to have a frank, open and honest conversation with the individual. You have to try and gain their trust. You have to ensure that they understand that anything that you tell them will remain confidential um, with the exception of uh, FRSA headquarters because individuals may well require further advice and support, clarification and um, suggestions from headquarters as to how they manage a particular case. But other than that, the conversations between the official and the member will remain confidential. It's key not to get emotionally connected with the case um, and by that I mean not to see things one-sided purely from the member's side. <clears throat> Bearing in mind that at the hearing you will provide um, a, a defence that is objective. If you, if you do that you will have more sympathy from the hearing chair um, rather than purely and simply see everything from the eyes of the, the member involved. You also need to focus on what is within your control. Um, so if a case has a serious allegation and the evidence is so strong that supports that allegation that irrespective of the best presentation available, the outcome will always be the same um, and, th and that the outcome isn't what 
ideally we would have wished for or the member would have wished for. Those matters can be out of our control and in those situations you must not beat yourself up on a member either uh, receiving a, the most serious sanction um, which, which can include dismissal. Some cases will end up at a stage of dismissal um, because the evidence is just so strong and there's, there's sometimes nothing you can do about that at all. You will probably be aware of the disciplinary levels but um, just for completeness we're going to go through them. So there's the informal level where an individual has some sort of misdemeanor and it's dealt with probably on station, probably by the crew or watch manager where there may be a note for file on something. That's the lowest possible level. Then it moves up uh, in stages. It's got stage one, which is the formal process, where there'll be a formal investigation and a formal hearing. Worst case scenario, that is likely to be a first written warning, depending on the seriousness of the allegation. Then you move on to stage two. Obviously, seriousness is increased. Um, the highest level of uh, sanction that can be given at a hearing would be a final written warning, which is probably likely to run for 18 months. And then level three, the most serious level. Again, there would be a, an investigation and a hearing. And ultimately, these uh, hearings involve alleged gross misconduct, which can result in dismissal or summary dismissal. The difference between the two is there's dismissal with notice. So depending on the length of service the individual has will de depend on how much notice they get. Summary dismissal is even more serious gross misconduct, whereby the individual is dismissed on the day of the hearing uh, without any notice or notice pay. On the subject of dismissals, um, the full response would be to appeal the dismissal. If that appeal was unsuccessful, there are occasions, depending on the details of the case, um, whereby we will support a member and take in his or her case to employment tribunal uh, under the auspices of an unfair dismissal claim. Again, um, there is absolutely no financial liability on the member throughout any of these processes whatsoever. Just a point on informal meetings. Um, history would suggest that it's very often the case that a manager will ask an individual to come in for an informal chat or an informal meeting. My view is that they, there are no such things as informal meetings. Meetings are usually formalized um, where there's a, a, a written record of the meeting. Um, there are numerous examples of individuals being asked to come into an informal chat or an informal meeting. And during the meeting, it, it's very clear that it's a formal meeting and part of a formal process. And something that's really important with regards to the difference between the two is anything that's informal representation, union representation is discretionary. So um, an individual is not entitled to have union representation. Any formal process, specifically stage one, two or three, the individual is entitled and should be offered the opportunity to have union representation. That could also be a workplace colleague and they can also choose not to have any represent representation at all. That, that, is, their, that is their choice. Um, but I've, I've dealt with numerous cases where you go through all the paperwork and there is a written note of a meeting between an officer and one of our members and they have no representation. It's being used as evidence against them. They may have said something that they shouldn't have done um, and they were not ever given the opportunity of having representation. The importance of that uh, will become apparent um, later on in this video. So this is what the disciplinary process should look like and normally looks like. 
um, through a staged process. So you have the initial act that is alleged misconduct or gross misconduct that the individual um, has done. Service becomes aware of that. Um, some conversations are had at a high level, probably also within HR. There's a decision as to whether to go through the formal process as part of an investigation. Uh, at that time, they, the service will have an idea whether they think that that allegation will warrant um, an investigation on, on at a stage of one, two or three, depending on the seriousness of that. And as I said before, as soon as the member is aware that they are part of a formal process, they need to contact the local official or headquarters as early as possible. Then interviews will commence as part of that investigation. Whether the um, person who is the subject of the disciplinary investigation is interviewed first or somewhere in between is really down to the investigating officer. There's no set, um, there's no set process with regards to who is interviewed when. But the importance of us being involved in that interview cannot be emphasised enough. There have again been numerous examples whereby an allegation has been made against the individual and that's what the investigation uh, is, is seeking to um, either confirm or deny. I've seen numerous occasions when an individual has just talked and talked and talked within an interview because they feel they have to uh, or because that is their type of personality etc and they've ended up expanding the complaint against them by um, admitting to other areas of investigation other misdemeanors the answers to the questions put by the investigating officer need to be as concise as possible if that means it can be a one word answer, then it needs to be a one word answer. Not forgetting that the witness statement will be used against the member at the forthcoming disciplinary hearing if there is one. The key for representing an individual in an interview is that they are asked appropriate questions relevant to the investigation. The interview is likely to be recorded. That can vary greatly from the investigator writing down notes of the interview which is not good practice very difficult to ask questions to absorb the answers to determine whether that answer requires a, a supplementary question or to go off on a different direction etc um, while making notes at the same time so what should happen is there should be a note taker within the room Alternatively, you might find that the interview is recorded via an audio device. That can have its advantages um, because alternatively, the notes that are taken might be wrong. Um, I've seen some absolutely appalling transcripts of meetings where you didn't know what the question that was asked, you didn't know what the answer was to the question. It's just an overview of an interview by an investigating officer that is subjective. That That is unacceptable. Um, but unfortunately, we're finding that more and more of late. And that brings me on to another point. Now, we have to ensure, just the same as um, competent firefighter, you would expect someone wearing BA to be trained. You would ex expect somebody to, to use in cutting equipment at a, um, a job to be trained, we would expect investigating officers to be trained to undertake investigations. You would be amazed how many people are not. Um, there are numerous occasions where an investigating officer, which could be at a level three, which could ultimately mean this individual is dismissed, which could ultimately mean that we end up at employment tribunal, that investigating officer has never undertaken an investigation before and have not had any training whatsoever, whatsoever with regards to that. That's unacceptable. So that question needs to be asked very, very early on to ensure 
that everybody who is part of that process from the service side is trained and competent in the role that they're being asked to perform. Once the interviews have been concluded and the investigation has been concluded, that will result in the investigating officer compiling a report. That report is supposed to be a fact-finding balanced report. They very, very rarely are. Normally, the investigating officer, partly because they've not been trained, are looking purely and simply for any evidence that substantiates the allegation and ignores any evidence that doesn't support the allegation, in fact, argues the exact opposite. And that's, that's where you provide the value of being the representative through this process. That report will be presented to the service. Um, the individual and the representative will have a copy of that report prior to the disciplinary hearing. Um, there then will be a period of one, two, three, four weeks um, whereby you are able to prepare for that disciplinary hearing. The amount of notice will depend on the seriousness of the allegation and the level of the hearing. Um, and then the, the last part of that process is the appeal. Now it could be that the hearing went very well, it was a fair outcome, um, and there isn't a requirement for an appeal. So there, there isn't always uh, the necessity to have an appeal. This is an excerpt from a local disciplinary, just by way of an example. Your local disciplinary policy should have very, very similar wording right um, at the outset of the document, probably within the introduction. Because the aim is to ensure consistent and fair treatment for all employees in dealing with the disciplinary issues. And that, that's also where we come in, to ensure that the member is dealt with fairly. Uh, and the primary aim is to bring out an improvement in the way that an individual and also the organisation performs and serves the public. That, that is also very difficult for services. They, they do like to beat people over the head with a stick. It's all about providing a punitive measure. It's all about going through the, the disciplinary process and the outcome is you know, you're going to get a written warning, you're going to get demoted, you're going to get dismissed, etc. like that. Other than cases of dismissal, there should always be an outcome whereby everybody feels that the process has been fair, that the outcome has been just, um, and very often there should be some sort of development plan to ensure that whatever misconduct has been proven doesn't happen again. That can also lead to a service-wide piece of work. The case may have identified a lack of understanding and trading service-wide. Um, so, so everybody should learn from the process. That very, very rarely happens, but it's something that we have to, to really push to ensure that when you go through this disciplinary process, we're all better for it. We've all learnt something at the end of it to ensure that we don't repeat those um, those situations again. So the policies and the procedures <coughs> that you need to identify will be the grey book, uh, particularly section 6b, which refers to conduct, capability and discipline. That's a useful resource to read. The local policy, which will be very, very similar to that particular section of the grey book. Timings are very important. Services are unbelievably poor at running a efficient disciplinary investigation to the point of out. If you look at ACAS, ACAS will talk about wrapping things up an investigation probably within seven days um, and the whole entire process probably within about three weeks. In the fire service, you are talking about months. Um, that there is some mitigation with regards to that because of annual leave, shift systems, uh, sickness, etc. Availability, particularly of on-call staff who have got their primary employment. But very often investigations will take roundabout as a rule of thumb probably six months from 
started an investigation to the hearing. That's far too long. It's unnecessary for it to be that long. And that's a long period of time for an individual's career to be uncertain. That's something that we have to keep pushing with services. When, when you have negotiation meetings, consultation meetings, when you're going through um, various policies and procedure, with regards to the disciplinary process, we have to emphasise the need for competent staff to undertake the process and for the entire period to be as short as possible. Because there is, a, there is definitely a welfare issue seen it time and time and time again when, especially if somebody is suspended pending the outcome of a disciplinary investigation, that person is pretty much isolated. They're not allowed to talk to any of their colleagues on station, any of their, their um, peers within the service. They're not allowed to go to the station. They're not allowed to go to fire service buildings without permission. And those periods of suspension I've known to last 12, 18 months. Um, they are paid during that time, but, but um, that doesn't negate their welfare. And while an individual will probably be assigned a welfare officer, services very often don't know what that welfare officer's job is. Um, I've known cases where the individual hasn't even been told who their welfare officer is, just that the service is aware that they have one, but they've never got round to telling the individual. Um, there needs to be regular welfare checks to make sure that an individual isn't suffering from mental health, poor mental health. Um, and to overcome a lot, a lot of that, the process has to be as short as possible. Uh, we've also got a responsibility ourselves in terms of that welfare. We need to make regular contact with the individual to check that they're okay, whether they've got any questions. Um, and, and to feed back any answers to any, any points that they raise. So in terms of housekeeping for you, the rep, ensure there's an audit trail. Um, any communications you've had with the service with regards to the investigation, um, make sure you've kept a note either through email or if you've made telephone conversations, make sure you've, you've made a note of those telephone conversations. Who, what, when and why keep us informed. Um, it could be, again, this has happened on occasion, it could be that you're more than capable and confident of dealing with a case, but something happens in your life whereby you're going to have to hand it over to a colleague or headquarters. So rather than coming completely cold, it would be good to have an, a heads up on how progress is, is going so that if we do need to get involved, me personally or whether I need to speak to a neighbouring official to get them to, to take the case on, that I've got a brief um, so that we know exactly where the case is, what we're up against uh, and what the plan is to defend the member. Keep in regular contact with the member, just again going back to welfare um, and talk about the importance of confidentiality between you and the member. <clears throat> and that um, at all stages they, they tell the truth. So this slide looks at the um, level of management that is used depending on the stage. So uh, stage one, the investigation would be undertaken by a minimum of a watch manager. The hearing would be undertaken by a minimum of a station manager. Uh, stage two, we go up. To, to station and group and stage three we go up to, to group and area manager which could be an area manager could be the assistant chief deputy chief or the chief so in terms of the investigation try and get hold of a copy of the terms of reference as early as possible so there can be absolute clarity as to what the allegations are against the member um, and that you're clear as the representative what the allegations are really important specifically with regards to the interview um, to ensure that the investigating officer doesn't deviate in the line of questions from what the allegations are again that hop that happens quite regular and you have to ensure that the member 
stays focused on what the allegations are, the investigating officer stays focused on what the allegations are, and that any questions that deviate from that, the member does not need to answer. Something I probably should have said earlier, with regards to that environment of the interview, you cannot, as the representative, you cannot answer any questions on behalf of the member. Only the member can answer the questions. You can have discussions with the member. Um, you can have as many breaks as you feel appropriate if the interview isn't going very well, if it's getting heated, if the member is getting extremely nervous and agitated. Take a break, take a breather, um, compose and then reconvene. But you're not able to answer questions on behalf of the member. You are there to ensure that the process is fair, that is um, focused and stays on track with regards to the allegations that have been before the individual. If there is any evidence that is supportive to the member, provide it to the investigating officer as early as possible. As I said before, that investigation is supposed to be balanced, it's supposed to be fact finding. Um, isn't always the case. Don't assume the investigating officer will pick up evidence that is contradictory to the allegation and is in support of the individual. Make sure that you provide it, make sure that there's a record of you providing that information. So this slide it talks about notice periods, which is really, again, really, really important, especially for stage three hearings where dismissal is on the table. Um, you are entitled to a minimum of seven days notice from receiving the hearing, what I call the hearing bundle, which will be the evidence used at the hearing. Um, so from seven days from receiving that bundle to the hearing for a stage one, 10 days for a stage two and 21 days for a stage three. Uh, bearing in mind that the service will have taken months to investigate the allegation or allegations, they suddenly, and this is again, this is recently is, and is becoming common, they suddenly have decided that they're going to call a hearing within seven days. So, firstly, that is outside of the grey book and they can't do that. But secondly, it's completely unreasonable to expect you uh, as a local official and the member to be able to digest the investigation report which which can run into the hundreds of pages sometimes to understand it to then prepare a case to defend it all within seven days it's not it's possible um, so the service has to comply with those time scales irrespective of what their local policy says. Any problems with that, contact headquarters. Um, you are also, they should also um, provide a mutual agreeable date rather than just say, this is the date of the hearing, which very often will be Monday to Friday, nine till five, at a time when the member isn't available uh, and the local official might not be available. So, in, in situations like that, go back to the brigade and say, OK, we can't make that particular date. It needs to be a mutual agreeable date and it needs to be a date that um, if, if the member's on call, if the local official's on call, um, then it's probably done at an evening or a weekend. As part of the investigation, it's, it's normal for the service to have interviewed at least one other person other than the accused. Now, it could well be that the service will call the individual as a witness person at the hearing, as well as having their statement. They are perfectly entitled to do that. Um, you are also perfectly entitled to call any relevant witnesses that you choose that you feel would help the case to defend the member. There are also character witnesses and character statements. Those are people who is very familiar with the member um, and will support their good character and will pro hopefully provide some sort of example as to why they believe they are of good character. What is 
of absolutely no use whatsoever is providing character statements from the individual's wife, husband, friend, neighbour, etc. What are of value are character statements from the individual's peers, um, line managers, other managers within the service, people of standing within the community who have had a long-standing relationship with the individual and know of them and can support their character. Whether the service calls any witnesses is out of your control. Whether you call any witnesses is completely within your control. However, um, a word of warning. Whether you decide to call a witness or not will be down to you. But the word of warning is this, while you may believe that witness is a supportive witness and you are able to ask the questions that you want, be aware that that witness may react in that environment of a disciplinary hearing where they may have had no experience of before. That witness may not react how you would expect and how you would wish. In addition to that, the service will be able to ask questions of your witness. I have no control over what questions are asked and you have no control how that particular witness responds to the question. So whether you call a witness or not is entirely up to you, but just be aware that the witness may not always be as helpful as what you had planned. For those of you that have never um, been in that particular environment before. This is a brief outline of the setup of a disciplinary hearing. It should be in a private room uh, without any disruptions. Normally the hearing chair will have an HR advisor with them. The in investigating officer very often will have a different HR advisor with them. Um, you will be there with the representative and there will be a space for any witnesses if they are called. The general format of the hearing will be introductions of everybody in the room. The investigating officer will present his or her report, which should be fact, factual based. Then you will be able to ask questions of the investigating officer and any witnesses they may have chosen to call. Once that is concluded, you will then be able to present on behalf of the member a case of the defence. Um, then questions can be directed either to yourself as a representative or as more likely would be the case towards the member. Once that's been concluded, there will be summaries by the investigating officer and by yourself of the overall case. Then there will be a break where the hearing chair will decide the outcome. The outcome could be one, one of a number of things. Um, there could be no case to answer, which would be a, a fantastic outcome. It would be a fantastic achievement for us and the member. Or there could be a disciplinary sanction, which depending on the level of hearing could range from a written warning all the way through to dismissal. Now, don't be surprised um, if, and this happens especially with regards to complicated stage three cases, that the chair decides that there has been so much information that he or she can't provide a decision on the day. This is more likely to happen where you have provided a really good defence and give them the given the food for thought in terms of um, how they thought the hearing was going to run. What should happen at the end of that hearing is that if a sanction is given, everybody in that room should be clear as to why that sanction has been given. That sounds common sense. However, on numerous occasions, we've represented members who have been awarded written warning, final written warning, dismissal, etc. And it didn't bear any resemblance to all the information that was presented at the hearing. 
it's just a decision that is not acceptable if somebody's going to be given a sanction they need to know why and it's all part of the fair process in ensuring that everyone at the end of it feels that they've been treated fairly if the written outcome does not provide information as to why the chair has made that decision challenge it and it can be challenged within the appeal um, or it just can be challenged as part of the process anyway because the di local disciplinary policy should make reference to the chair justifying the decision that they've made not just saying we've had a hearing um, and the decision is that I'm going to award such and such a sanction that's not acceptable unfortunately it happens a lot what we're seeing a lot more of over the last few years are allegations against members of breaching or contravening core values and or bringing the service into disrepute or serious disrepute many um, service disciplinary documents and policies will refer to ACAS code of practice great book and following the principles of natural justice one of the principles of natural justice in terms of um, employment law and the disciplinary process is that if you are answerable to an allegation you must know what that allegation is we're dealing with a case where the allegation is that the member has breached core values and there is no further detail at all it's imperative that you speak to the brigade requesting the further detail it's very very difficult nigh on impossible to defend a member where the allegation has breached the core values if you do not know what values that they have breached or how that they have breached them or the implications of the aforementioned breach the same can be said for an allegation of bringing the service into disrepute or serious disrepute what does that actually mean how have they brought the service into disrepute um, when to bring the service into disrepute could they control not bringing the service into disrepute the general understanding of bringing an organization into disrepute or ser uh, serious disrepute would be um, affecting public confidence in the organization by bringing a piece of information out into the public domain um, more often than not through the, the media a quick example would be a firefighter's caught drink driving caught by the police um, um, and found guilty and has a, a, a criminal conviction and that finds its way into the local paper that would be an allegation of bringing the service into disrepute if no such thing or similar thing has happened um, there shouldn't be any grounds um, to legitimize an allegation of the member bringing the service into disrepute so that's just to give you uh, uh, an overview with regards to those two allegations that are becoming more common of late if you find yourself managing a case um, that includes either or both of those allegations um, ensure that there is further detail provided by the service because it's almost impossible um, both to defend those two allegations without further detail but also for the service to um, substantiate those two allegations without any further detail in isolation they are meaningless so just looking at the appeal process you may or may not need to appeal the case depending on the outcome and depending on whether it's fair the appeal process is a statutory right so the service must provide the member with an opportunity to appeal the original decision the appeal should be heard at a higher managerial level level than the original hearing so if the hearing was an area manager then the appeal would need to be at a assistant or deputy chief um, or there are occasions depending on local service agreement it could be that the appeal will be heard by fire authority members something that is not very well known is that at the appeal the sanction cannot get any worse so whatever outcome you've got from the hearing 
whether it be let's say a final written warning if you go to appeal that final written warning cannot become a dismissal so you've already already had the worst sanction you can possibly get at the hearing at the appeal they may uphold the original sanction or they may come to a conclusion of a lesser sanction or they may even throw the whole case out and say there is no case to answer so you must have reasons to appeal a decision and those reasons will fall under four categories um, in no particular order that you may have new evidence that has come to light that will be uh, supportive towards the member you may believe that the sanction was too severe that goes back to fairness and consistency if um, previous outcomes of a similar nature have resulted in a fir first warning and your member's been given a, a final written warning then you can argue that the sanction is too severe there may be a procedural failure the service may not have failed a fair sorry may not have followed a fair process that regularly happens services for whatever reason don't seem to be aware of the detail of their own policy and don't follow it <clears throat> again in terms of procedural failure if you're not sure contact headquarters and, and we can have that discussion and lastly not proven on the balance of probability this it rarely is put forward as a grounds of appeal but what that means is that the allegation just there was no evidence or not, not not anywhere near enough evidence to substantiate that it actually happened um, and the burden of proof within this particular forum within employment law is on the balance of probability so there's a very crude example if two people are saying one thing one person is saying another then on the balance of probability what the two people saying is going to be believed it's it's pretty much as simple as that it's a very very low level of proof in a court of law you've got um, the burden of proof is beyond doubt beyond reasonable doubt um, we're not dealing with that with a balance of probability thank you for taking the time to watch this video I hope you found it informative I certainly hope I haven't put you off um, because representing members through the disciplinary process can be one of the most rewarding roles that uh, a union official can undertake your involvement can make the difference between somebody keeping or losing their job it can be the difference between having um, a final written warning hanging over somebody's head for 18 months for two to two years it can be the difference between somebody so disillusioned with the job that they end up leaving uh, voluntarily anyway so do not in underestimate the value and the impact that you can have when representing members through this process um, this is the second in a series of um, training videos and we'll be doing some more on other subjects any feedback will be welcomed so again thanks for your time thanks for watching and taking part in this training exercise and take care and see you soon